Open your Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Heavenly Father, help me to preach the word of God today as you would have it to be preached. Help people to receive it as you would have them receive it. We commit the message to you and the results of the message as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 9, I will begin reading in verse 8. The first seven verses, the Lord gives us several messianic promises that are among the most sublime of all the Old Testament. For example, verse 6, speaking of the birth of Christ, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, etc. A messianic prophecy here in the early part of chapter 9. Verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light a messianic prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he gets to verse 8, and the theme and the subject of the chapter changes completely. Let's begin reading. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel, and all the people shall know, even Ephraim, Ephraim, as you probably know, was the principal tribe of the nation of Israel. And the inhabitant of Samaria, Samaria was the capital city of the northern nation of Israel. I'm talking about the divided kingdom of Israel. So when he says Ephraim, he's talking about the chief tribe of the northern kingdom and when he talks about Samaria he's talking about the capital city and all the people shall know even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria that say in the pride and stoutness of heart the bricks are fallen down but we will build with hewn stones the sycamores are cut down but we will change them into cedars. In other words, what God is saying here is God has judged their homes. He has judged their cities, their villages, and the bricks collapsed under the judgment of God. Instead of Israel repenting and turning to God, because of his judgments, they, they just basically shake their fist at God and say, okay, you've destroyed our bricks, we'll build with stones. And then the same thing, the sycamores are cut down, we'll change them into cedars. In other words, God, whatever you destroy, we don't care, we'll just build again with something else will do something else and you judge that and will do something else we are not going to submit to you that's what god is communicating therefore the lord shall set up the adversaries of retzin who was the king of syria against him and join his enemies together the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this, his anger is turned away, is not turned away, excuse me, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the next three verses are my text for the most part. Therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel head 
and tail, branch and rush in one day. Verse 15, the ancient and honorable, he is the head. The prophet that speaketh lies, he is the tail. For the leaders, verse 16, for the leaders of this people, cause them to err, and they that are led of them, the leaders, are destroyed. We just finish it, the chapter for context. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have mercy on the fatherless and the widows. For every one is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all of this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the, devour the briars and thorns, shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, they shall mount up like the lifting of a smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand and shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm, Manasseh, Ephraim, Ephraim, and Manasseh. These two tribes had a lot of controversy with the other 10 tribes. But between themselves, they had extreme affection. Because after all, it was the two brothers that were the patriarchs of these two tribes. And so they were, they were kin. And because of the close relationship of the brothers, Ephraim and Manasseh, while the other tribes of Israel had much controversy with the two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, those two tribes always got along well together. They did not fight among themselves. So this is what the prophet is telling us here when he says, they shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh Ephraim, Ephraim, Manasseh. During the judgment of God that, that Isaiah is here predicting, the two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh will become hostile against each other. They will hate each other, they will fight each other, and they will destroy each other in and through the judgment of God. So brother is turned against brother, family against family, tribe against tribe, and they literally slaughter one another. That's what it means, every man eating the flesh of his own arm. And they together, Ephraim and Manasseh, shall be against Judah the southern tribe, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So following the messianic prophecies in verses one through seven, it, Isaiah again foretells Israel's coming destruction by first the Syrians and the Philistines and eventually by the Babylonians and the Romans. How much of the prophets' books are devoted to the destruction of Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem? And all these dispensational futurists who choose to ignore the teaching of the New Testament and refuse to accept the new covenant and believe that they are still part of the old covenant and the old covenant is part of the new covenant. They need to tear out the vast majority of the prophecies in the books 
of the Old Testament. Because so much of those prophecies deal with what we're talking about today in chapter 9, the destruction of Jerusalem and Judah and Jerusalem. Did you notice, though, even as Jehovah was, rewar was warning Israel of its impending destruction, he extended his hand of mercy if they would turn back to God. Did you notice that? Three times in the text that we read, the Lord said, His anger is not turned away. His anger is not turned away. The judgment is not turned away. But his hand of forgiveness and love and, and cleansing is extended even as God gives the judgment upon Israel, he extends his hands of mercy if they will accept it. Isn't that amazing? Our God. Even in judgment, he loves us and extends his hand of mercy toward us. How long will God be patient with America's pastors and churches. Remember the judgment that God gave to Israel was a judgment upon his people. It was not a judgment upon the heathen. It was a judgment on his people, God's people. What you and I are seeing today in our country, and we recognize it to be judgment of God, rightly so. Please do not mistake. This judgment is not upon the pagan heathen that live around us. This judgment is on the pastors and churches of this country. The judgment is on his people. How long will God be patient with America's pastors and churches? How long will America's pastors and churches continue in their stubborn, self-centered ways? As God tears down the bricks, they want to build again with stones as if God has not spoken, as if somehow we can circumvent the judgment of God through our own wisdom and our own effort. We are going to show God that we are smarter than him, we are more powerful than him, we do not need him, we can do it without him. That's the message Israel sent to God, and that's the message that many Christians are sending to God today. How long will Christians in our churches continue to ignore the new covenant? The truth of the new covenant and promote the prosperity, entertainment, feel good, motivational, false Gospels. Has there been any change in the way these prosperity preachers are preaching since God began judging America several years ago? Has there been any change to the motivational preaching and the feel good? preaching and the entertainment preaching has there been any change whatsoever in the message of these apostate churches are they blind are they blinded by their own success blinded by their own wealth blinded by their own achievement as they see God tearing down the bricks, it doesn't bother them because they have enough substance to build in any form, in any way. 
Look at the way we are enriched, they say to themselves. Look at the numbers of people that come to our congregations. Look at the size of our buildings. Look at the number of our programs. Look at the people on our staff. Look at all of the success that we have in this world. Yeah, but do you not see what God is doing to your country? Do you not see what God is doing to the liberties of the people in this country? No, they don't. They refuse to see the truth. They are so absorbed in their own success, nothing phases them. How long will they promote and praise the dead, rotting corpse of the old covenant? How long will God allow the covenant that he abolished with his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his giving of the Holy Spirit, the destruction of Jerusalem, the exclamation point that the old covenant was dead, the new covenant of Jesus Christ is now alive forevermore in the church. How long are people going to dredge up this old, rotting, dead corpse and put it on display in their churches and encourage their people to worship it, to praise it, to promote it. How long will God allow that to happen? Amen. Notice before the Syrians and the Philistines are allowed to invade and conquer the land, God takes away the ancient and the honorable. The ancient and the honorable. These are, the prophet said, these are the head. These are the head. I'm cutting off the head of the nation. What's the head? The head, the ancient, and the honorable men of Israel. These were men of age and men of distinction. These were men of wisdom and knowledge. These were men with righteous influence. These were good men who were revered and respected. Before destruction comes, these men are taken away from the people. The ancient men of wisdom and honor and knowledge, God removes from the nation as a matter of judgment. And he refers to that as cutting off the head. The strength of this nation, of any nation, is not its politicians, its governmental institutions, its military. The strength of any nation are the godly men of wisdom and knowledge that are able to have an influence for righteousness among the people that the people will honor and accept. That is the strength of any nation. And God says before the Syrians come, before the Philistines come, I'm going to cut off the head of this nation. That's the honorable, ancient men of distinction and wisdom. And then, verse 16, for the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. When you don't have the honorable and ancient 
men of wisdom to help guide and counsel the nation. You are left with spoiled, self-serving, ambitious, evil men who rule for their own benefit. And people that follow such men are led to destruction, according to our verse in verse 16. Tell me, where are the wise, honorable, esteemed men of distinction and reverence today? Think in your mind. Name them. Make your list. Where are they? Name the wise, ancient, honorable men of distinction in our country today. Where are they in government? The last man I can think of, and I've known a lot of politicians. I've known a lot of statesmen. I've known men of several generations. My experience, God has given me such a vast, wide scope of experience. And I was able to meet and to get to know many, many, many of the men in our government over the last half, half century, for good and for bad. There was a time whenever, I, if I were asking myself this question, where are the wise, honorable men of distinction today? If, if this was 30 years ago, I could have filled up a notepad with, with men that I could think of that met that requirement. Today, as I stand before you, the only man I can think of that fits that, dis that description was booed off the stage by so-called Christians and conservatives in South Carolina in 2012. I'm talking about Dr. Ron Paul. He is the only man I can think of that meets the description that we're seeing here in this chapter. Name the wise, ancient, honorable men in government today. Look at our president, Joe Biden. I know you'd rather not. He is America's murderer in chief as he does everything he can to ensure the legal killing of unborn babies. He is America's socialist in chief as he does everything he can to destroy constitutional liberty, including the natural right of self-defense. This is the man we call president. Look at our Republican leader, Mitch McConnell. He spends as much time or more working for causes being advanced by liberal Democrats as he does working for causes being advanced by conservative Republicans. But mostly, he spends his time working for the socialist Pied Pipers of the CFR which of course includes his Chinese wife. And if last Tuesday's elections prove anything at all, they prove that Donald Trump is a plague upon the Republican Party. Now I want to put this in perspective for you. We have the most unpopular president and vice president in U.S. history in the White House. 
I'm not making that up and I'm not exaggerating. Go check the facts. Poll after poll says those two, the president and vice president currently in office, are the most unpopular duo in the history of the United States of America. And last Tuesday, the Democrats scored their biggest midterm victory ever. I don't know whether you realize that or not. Last Tuesday, the Democrats scored their biggest midterm election victory ever in U.S. history. How is that possible? You have the most unpopular Democrat president and vice president in the White House, and yet their party wins its biggest victory ever. And I hear what some of you are thinking right away. Well, Brother Chuck, it was voter fraud. Voter fraud did it. Voter fraud. You can say that if you want to. And no doubt, every election since the beginning of time has had a certain amount of vote fraud. There's no doubt that that exists. I'm not denying it. I'm not saying that it doesn't. But the deep state hopes that you give in to this fatalistic blame vote fraud trap because then you will do nothing except stay home and bellyache about all of the vote fraud going on instead of standing up and using your God-given abilities, which are considerable, by the way, to actually help clean up your government. And you can start by being the honorable man and woman that God wants you to be yourself. Before you start griping about how dishonorable the politicians are, go look in the mirror. How honorable are you? What are you doing for righteousness sake? What are you doing to be the salt and the light in your community, in your county, in your district, in your state, in your country, in your sphere of influence? Starts with you. And then work with and for other honorable men and women and stop supporting the lesser of two evils establishment candidates. Stop it. Our friend Rick Jor, who lives just a few miles from us, one of the great liberty champions in the state of Montana, and I'm proud to call him a friend. Rick Jor once wrote this, and I want you to listen to what he said because it's so profoundly true. Liberty is internal to external. Liberty is internal to external. Apart from the internal liberty gained by the work of Christ on the cross, true external liberty is impossible. And for my part, I am convinced that Christ himself expects internal liberty to be manifested externally, which is why I believe that allowing oneself to become or live as a slave is sin. Liberty is internal to external. If we are not free internally, if our soul is not free, 
If our spirit is not free, if our mind is not free, if our heart is not free, all that we say about liberty is moot. And we have no ability to give liberty or to work in liberty's favor effectively if we ourselves are bound in chains inside our hearts. That's why Jesus said, if the Son, S-O-N, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There is no true liberty without Jesus Christ. There is no true liberty without His grace, His blessing, His mercy. If you reject God and His grace through Christ, you have rejected the liberation of your own heart. You are in bondage yourself to all kinds of evil, machination, and sin. Sins of the heart, sins of the flesh, sins of the mind, sins of the eyes, sins of the mouth, sin, sins of, of the internal being of our soul. Jesus came to liberate us from the chains of sin that bind us. He, cha he came to liberate our minds from the wisdom of man which is contrary to the wisdom of God and replace it with the laws of God in our heart. He came to give us a spiritual freedom, an internal freedom without which there will never be external freedom. The reason we are losing the external freedoms of our country is because men and women of this country have lost the liberty of their hearts. They do not know Christ. They do not care to know Christ. In fact, they openly reject Him. Without His liberating power, there is no freedom. In November of last year, I wrote this in my national column. If you don't get that, we'll send it to you free in your email inbox every week, once a week. All you got to do is go to my website, chuckbaldwinlive.com. At the top of the page, it says subscribe to my columns. Just click subscribe. Put in your email address. That's it. It's free of charge. Every Thursday, you'll receive my syndicated column in your email inbox. Tens of thousands of people already do that. Last November, I said this. I see only one way for the GOP to lose the White House in 2024. Only one way for them to lose the White House. And that is if they nominate Donald Trump. So if you Republicans have a death wish, go ahead and nominate this con man, but don't say, I didn't warn you. And what happened this past Tuesday is a precursor as to what will happen in 2024 if the GOP stays with that corrupt huckster Donald Trump. And you can write me all the emails you want. It doesn't change the truth one bit. Donald Trump is a plant. He has always been a plant. Whether he knows he's a plant or not is another question. But he's a plant. Name the wise, ancient, honorable man in the church today. 
Look at our evangelical leaders. Robert Jeffress, Franklin Graham, Kenneth Copeland, John Hagee, Joel Osteen. These men are all servants of the Antichrist beastly system as the past two and a half years have proven. They are the servants of the Antichrist beastly system. These men are all promoters of Zionism and the Old Covenant. The ancient honorable prophets that stood tall for Christ, stood tall for truth, stood tall for liberty that I have known throughout my ministerial life, have all gone to heaven except one man who is 93 years old, long retired, my dearest pastor friend and mentor I ever knew, Dr. Kenny McComas. He's still alive, but obviously his active ministry days are behind him. It seems to me that God has already taken away most of the head. And what we have left is the tail. Isaiah said the tail is the lying prophets that lead the nation to destruction. There's always been lying prophets. But there's also always been the honorable ancients to warn people about the lying prophets and to steer the nation away from the lying prophets. Today, the lying prophets have a monopoly on television, radio, politics, the church, business, societal, sports, you name it. The lying prophets are the only ones that are being heard. The head has been slowly removed by God from our country. That is a mark of a nation headed for judgment. Again, verse 16, for the leaders of this people caused them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. We keep looking to Washington, D.C. to save us. You're looking at the wrong Savior. Amen. The right Savior is not located in Washington, D.C. He's located on the throne of heaven. Until we start looking to him for our temporal salvation, we will never find it. Even as God and his anger are upon us, his anger is not turned away, but his hand of love and mercy is stretched out still. Even as I speak, even as the head is being removed, even as the tail is spinning its lies through its false prophets, even as the Syrians and the Philistines are getting ever closer and closer to our borders, even as all of these events are taking place, his hand of mercy and love is extended to America.
Oh, that our nation would have the wisdom to accept his love and forgiveness. I will say again what I've said dozens of times previously, America's problems are not primarily political, they are spiritual. We are not going to vote our way out of this, folks. As much as it, it behooves us to vote and to do everything that we can as free Americans to exercise our right to vote, we should do that. I am one of the foremost proponents of that. I am not given to fatalism. I am not given to the attitude that, oh, well, everybody's cheating anyway. My vote doesn't count. I don't buy that. I believe and I know, not only because of what God's word says, but because of what our history tells us, the greatest power in this country is not among the politicians, it is among the people of this country. When we've had enough, it will be enough. As long as we tolerate the usurpation of our liberties, they will continue to be trampled as they are. We must stop following the carnal wisdom of men and start following the divine wisdom of God. Forget about what all of the pundits are telling you. Forget about all of everything that Fox News is telling you. Forget about what you're reading in the papers. That's all the wisdom of men. Get in this book. Find out what God is telling you. His word is true. His word. Read the history of the great men and women who knew God and who followed God and who walked with God and who incorporated the principles of God's word into their lives and into their work. Read of them. Read of their experiences. Read of their wisdom. Read in, in, in what they have told us. We must forsake false teachers. Is the mic still hot? I know the pulp is hot. <laughs> I just wonder if the mic was still hot. Okay, it sounds better. As long as the thousands continue to throng to the houses of deception and to the false teachers on the platforms, they will never change. They will continue to disseminate their falsehood. And people will continue to be deceived. And our nation will continue to go into the direction it's headed. The best thing that we could do for America is for every Christian who is attending one of these old covenant beastly system praising preachers and churches and get out of those institutions of degradation and find a man of God, look and search, find a man of God that will tell you the truth and then do everything you can to support that servant of God. That! will do more for our country and the freedom of our country than anything we could do politically. Amen. As one man said when he left the Liberty Fellowship, well, you know, I like Brother Chuck, but he just wouldn't stop talking about the politicians. <laughs> I 
I get that. Anybody would rather believe a lying politician than a truth-telling pastor, right? <laughs> but that's exactly what these people across America have done. In their hearts, they have chosen to believe the lying politicians and the lying prophets instead of a truth-telling man of God. If you want the truth to continue to be told, then you support the men who are telling the truth. We must forsake false teachers. We must learn and love the precious truths of Christ's new covenant. Since I started the Israel package back in 2014, all the way through the messages contained in the Israel packages, and now we're in the prophecy series. Set one of the package is already finished. We're now getting close to having the second package ready to go. I hope that by now, those of you that have followed us, those of you that have done your due diligence to prayerfully study the word of God and apply yourself to the truth of God's word, and you've been able to keep up with the teaching of the new covenant, I hope that you have already figured this out. Prophecy is not about prophecy. Prophecy is about the new covenant. Are you getting that? I hope you're starting to get that. The book of Revelation is a book about the new covenant covenant explaining it to us the book of Hebrews is a book about the new covenant the book of Galatians is a book about the new covenant the book of Romans is a book about the new covenant these great books of the New Testament are teaching us one thing the truth the glory the majesty, the power, the brilliance, the might of the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Learn the new covenant. Love the new covenant. Fall in love maybe before you never really understood it. I didn't understand it. And I preached for over 30 years the New Testament and never really comprehended the new covenant. Now that my eyes have been opened, <laughs> everything is so clear. You can see falsehood so easily. You, you can see the, the glory of the New Testament and the inferiority of the, old, uh, of the Old Covenant. You can see the glory of what Jesus did over the Old Covenant law of Moses. You're able to comprehend the work of Jesus on the cross. You're able to comprehend the work of the Holy Spirit making us a body and a family of one in Christ. You can understand spiritual Israel and everything related to the subject of Israel. It all comes into focus when you understand the new covenant. I, however many years God gives me yet to preach, here is my pledge to my Lord and to you. I am gonna spend the rest of my life teaching, praising, promoting the glory, the wonder, the majesty of the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Let me close with this. That we have leaders like Biden and McConnell and Trump and Jeffress and Graham and Osteen is a divine proclamation that God is very displeased with his people. We wouldn't even know their names if God's blessing was on this country. The fact that we not only know them, but they occupy the positions of prominence and power that they do is a telltale sign that God is displeased with his people and he's giving us over to judgment. When the Lord is once again pleased with his people, liberty will be restored because Christ is liberty and the author of it. Amen. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.